Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could teach the gullible to never be so comfortable with eyes they eat like comfort food? To disregard the bogus claims and pseudo-scientific claims, can you imagine just how much indeed the world would change? No more political predators playing on the populace, but ill can plots to shift and kill Metropolis. No more villains with the title in the Bible, holding phony temper writers like the stuff they teach is vital. Imagine it was normal to have to prove a claim to make. The folks who really feel ashamed of expressing content that was fake. It's not to say we never make mistakes, it's just to say we go out of our way to show the evidence it takes. Remain skeptical while you travel the world or even stay trapped. We're allowed to get fast, that's what it is, yo. Yeah. Keep reality intact to help the truth grow. Uh-huh. Question every claim, especially the ones you believe in. Remain skeptical while you travel the world or reason. Hi everybody, good afternoon. I'm Tiffany Harding. And I'm Marcelo Arteaga. And welcome to the 150th episode of Road to Reason. Yay! <laughs> so we've, been, we've had a great time with the, the past 150 episodes and we hope to keep going for 150,000 more. Okay, so why don't we um, get started on today. We have, um, we have quite an exciting guest, Craig A. James. He's written a book called The Religion Virus, and we are going to talk to him today about his book and about his opinions on what religion is doing to our society and what religion has done to our society um, since the beginning of time, really. So um, we have to look at that. But before we get to him, we have some news stories that we'd like to get to. So. Uh, first on our list of news, we have the case of Alabama. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yes, yeah, so um, the state of Alabama, and I don't want to make fun of Alabama, but um, they had a vote with their... Um, As we're running a sticker on one of the evolutionary books that they... One of the books in, I guess, biology they used to explain the evolution, they have a sticker that says... Basically, evolution is just a theory, and it yep. should be, you know, it shouldn't be taken um, very seriously. So they actually had a vote mm-hmm. whether or not to keep this four paragraphs long. If you, you can see it on your screen right now, it, the vote was unanimous to keep it on science textbooks to say that the word theory, quote unquote, has many meanings. Evolution by natural selection is a controversial theory, which it is not. Okay, there's no controversy. Uh, everyone accepts it. Everyone accepts it as fact. But of course, this is just a way to inject religion into science, trying to teach that creationism. Well, I mean, to be fair, I think that they try to say there, there's contingency or there, there's, there's a section of the population that disagrees with it. It happens to be the people who, who are on the board of the education. And <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean, that what he should have said is the consensus is not broad in society, but that is meaningless. The, what it should, the only way that could be a meaningful statement is if, we're the, if, if they could prove there's not a scientific community consensus. If they could say, you know, a significant percentage of the scientific community disagrees with it, well, when then, then that's uh, a, a better claim. But, um, you, you know, know, you they know, they want to teach the controversy. Exactly. They want to treat, teach know? the controversy. Well, and whatever. as long as people, they can find a couple thousand, you know, ignorant people who disagree with something, they, yeah. can, they can claim that that's a reasonable statement for them to place on that book. I mean, it's, um, yeah, there are lots of theories, like for example, gravity. The, the, it's a theory, the theory that um, the large masses pull other you know, masses to, that's a theory. There's no up or down about it, there's no wishy-washiness about it. It's true, it's there, it happens. Right. But if I say, well, we want to teach the controversy that maybe giant magnets under our feet keep us to the ground. You know, we could talk, we could talk all day about this, but let's move on, let's right. move on. Well, one, one last thing that I, I was thing is interesting about this case is that they always say that evolution is a theory and to the extent that they talk about like macroevolution right you cannot see the the path that, that uh, humans have taken to their current um, form but microevolution seen on on, on cells yeah. and multicellular evolution uh, multicellular organisms are, i mean unicellular organisms and smaller like viruses or smaller organisms have proven to evolve we're going to i know yeah, we go proved we go we go we're going to come back to it we're going to come back to it um, we also want to talk about um, the NFL mm-hmm. and what they're telling Georgia 
So um, yeah, in this case, uh, I believe the state of Georgia is trying to pass some anti-gay legislation. Long story short, it's a religious and freedom, a religious freedom bill. And the, the people in the NFL are threatening not to have the Super Bowl on their state if they pass this bill. Yeah, um, Atlanta Falcons are building a brand new shiny stadium, and um, it's going to cost a lot of money. And they've been pushing for the 2019 Super Bowl. NFL saying no, no, no. No, no, no. If you pass this anti-gay bill, we're not letting, we're not giving you our business, and that could cost the state millions, millions of dollars. And um, jo uh, the NFL is not the only company that's um, threatening Georgia over this bill. So I mean, it's still it, we, we've got a ways to go. And we thought that back this past year with the Supreme Court and gay marriage, we got a ways to go. Let's move on to our next story real quick. My favorite person in the whole wide world. Neil deGrasse Tyson? Oh, no, no, the other one. <laughs> Ken Ham. Oh, okay. Is, <laughs> Ken Ham is in the news again. He's accusing Neil deGrasse Tyson because, you know, Cosmos is coming back, I believe. And Ken Pretty Ham, cool. yeah, Cosmos is an awesome show. Definitely watch it. Yes, definitely watch it. But Ken Ham says that um, Neil deGrasse Tyson and the show Cosmos are teaching students to worship nature and stars and it's anti-god and anti-religious mm -hmm. and this man actually does assemblies and things like that telling people that uh, basically everything um, everything science is wrong and it's all anti-god but we have the atheist group that are slowly standing up this is another piece of news slowly standing up to Ken Ham with their billboard. Right, and um, in their billboard, uh, if I remember correctly, they're talking about getting private money. They're, they probably have some type of funding campaign online mm -hmm. where they're asking for money from people to place near the park um, that he has. Uh, a, a, a billboard that says something regarding um, genocide, genocide, and, and uh, <laughs> some and what's it like genocide and incest. Uh, and, and incest um, how to call it a uh, museum, you know, uh, because also of the fostering park. mythology, mythological uh, no. thoughts. So and, yeah, it's coming along. He's building this gigantic um, uh, Christian fantasy theme park where they're building a scale model. They mm -hmm. think or they say mm -hmm. of the ark. I don't know if it's yeah, yeah. It's, it's, oh, it's a scale, scale no, model. I, I will. No, I think it's supposed to be the right size. I could I could be wrong. I hope it's the right size. I've seen pictures. That'd be great. And yeah, That'd no, be awesome. I'm not gonna lie, that's actually a pretty cool idea. I think <laughs> I think that actually trying to build the ark and actually putting trying to place all the animals on earth to see if they're fit, if they fit on the ark, it's a legitimate hey, good idea. That's what he like says. if he if he believes in the principles, right? He's he's gonna be able to find to of every kind of every animal in the planet. And bring and them on in there. Exactly. Well, I mean, but that's the thing. We um, we were going to have our joke of the week, but no, we'll just have Ken Ham as our joke of the week. I mean, he's spending a lot of money and time on trying to get this ARC project off the wall, and they even had a controversy with him mm -hmm. um, using taxpayer money to right. build it. But, um, yeah, Ken Ham is a joke, and he, he works so hard. I just wish that somebody with his tenacity was just pointed in a totally different direction. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, we wanted to talk um, one more thing we wanted to talk about. Um, Vox.com put out a really, really interesting video mm -hmm. um, on evolution. It's a proof of evolution that you can find in your own body. And this video recently went viral. And um, basically, like certain tendons that we have that we don't use. I don't know if you can see it. See, like, uh, like this stringy thing right here. Yeah. That's a tendon that's attached to a muscle that we don't use. It's from when our ancestors hung on trees and the Ice Age dried up those trees and turned Africa into savanna. And then we apes moved out of the trees and onto the plains and we no longer needed those. But right. some mm -hmm. people still have them. That's sort of thing. Very interesting um, to introduce some people who might not normally read about right. that sort of thing about you know parts of our bodies are still remnants of evolution it's very yeah. interesting so Pers check it out yeah personally i found really interesting mm -hmm. the explanation for why we have good uh, goosebumps goosebumps because like in um fairy animals when they um when they're trying to prevent them from themselves from getting really cold their fur uh sticks uh straight 
and that insulates the animal. And when, you know, when since they we even come from apes, about how is an emotional mm -hmm. response to fear, to fear, or to aggression, or to, to, look, extreme, to look larger, to look larger. And it's why you sometimes get goosebumps when you hear nice music that you like, because mm -hmm. um, you well, you're no, adrenaline or something. I thought it was the, the argument was when you get. Um, I mean, when you get excited or when you get uh, fearful, you get goosebumps because you're trying to appear larger. But that's yeah. true. So um, that's our news for this week. We, um, we're going to go to break in a few mm -hmm. here. But um, when we come back, I'm really excited about talking to Mr. James. And I um, want to talk about his book, his books. He has two, uh, The Religion Virus and Is Christianity Dying? And we are going to come back with that. And um, if you want to give us a call, you know, our call-in information should be down at the bottom here. Mm -hmm. If you want, if you have any questions to ask him. Call us. Call us and let us know. So we'll get to him and we'll be right back. A critical thinker is in a frame of mind of always questioning everything, including things they don't necessarily want to question. You may have done some research and satisfied yourself on a position you're sure is right. Good. Now, after a month or two of that, go look at some research that opposes your point of view or challenges the position you've taken. You can even look into it with the idea of poking holes in their arguments if you want, but it would be better to just have an open mind and read it as though you'd never heard or seen anything on the issue before. You may be very surprised what you learn, and if you're doing this right, you will be. Always be open to opposing points of view and counter arguments. That's what critical thinking is all about. And now you know. Good. Homemade noodles. Oh. Marty, stop it. Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. It reminds me, I've been thinking uh, maybe we should try a new form of birth control. I heard about this one, it's called the IUD, intrauterine device. Or we could try the patch on your arm. Actually, I think that one goes on your butt. Bedsider.org has birth control information and a lot more. And it's... What do you think, though? Arm or the butt? There's a lot of tree branches and dry brush over here. We should probably move the bonfire over there. I'm guessing Smokey liked that idea. This is Richard Dawkins. Doing commercials is unfamiliar territory for me, but I'm inviting you to watch Road to Reason, a skeptic's guide to the 21st century, on Fairfax Public Access every Sunday. Each week, the hosts tackle wishful thinking, religion, pseudoscience, and the harm they cause with a combination of facts, humor, and community involvement. They challenge believers to defend their faith and give you, the skeptic, a voice. With live call-ins for viewers and streaming on the World Wide Web, there's never a dull moment. Don't wait. Look at them now on Facebook and YouTube. And remember to watch Road to Reason, a skeptic's guide to the 21st century. Or they'll be hell to pay. Body language can tell you all sorts of things. Like someone is having a stroke. Know the sudden signs. Learn fast. Face drooping. Arm weakness. Speech difficulty. Time to call 911 and get them to a hospital immediately. Learn the body language and spot a stroke yeah. fast. Curse me. Oh, welcome back. Welcome We're back. back. Oh my gosh. So, um, welcome back mm -hmm. to our 150th episode extravaganza. Mm -hmm. We have Craig A. James on the line right now, joining us via Skype through the internet. It's a series of tubes. Um, hello, Mr. James. Thank hello. you for joining us. Hello. It's good to be here. Thank you for having me. And so, um, we want to talk to you about your book and um, the religious, I can't speak, the religion virus, why we believe in God. So there's our book. Um, I have a question. Um, why did you pick that graphic for the front of the book? <laughs> 
that particular graphic is a classic uh, painting of Adam and Eve mm -hmm. set into the middle of a an AIDS virus. Uh, just, oh, <laughs> that's, 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 that's a little bit a, controversial right there, but uh, go yeah, ahead. <laughs> just kind of illustrating the point mm -hmm. uh, that uh, religion is a virus. All right, so so I think we should start with the, the obvious question, which is, you know, why or don't you think people will find this offensive and? Uh, is that the intent, like to be, yeah. I mean... Who's your audience? Right. Who's your audience? <laughs> is it for uh, people like us? When you, uh, yeah, it is people, well, it's actually not people like you, although I'm glad people like you enjoy the book. Thank you. I actually wrote the book for people who were not atheists, who uh, were essentially recovering from religion or wondering how their religion came to be the way it is. Um, I, there's a story in the book about my Aunt Carolyn who had spent... Um, many years battling her beliefs, trying to figure out what she really believed, and she finally, the, the story uh, is she, there was a catastrophic event that she uh, was, saw in the Central America about a volcano and killed some people, and she just saw, thought, finally, there can't be a God. This just doesn't make any sense. But even having believed that, she felt bad. She had all these ideas that infected her brain, and she um, never really quite got over it. And when she, she read some of the earliest drafts of my book, and after reading it the first time, she said, I feel so much better now. Yeah. And that was a really big deal to me, to take a person like this who had been struggling with religion and help them understand why religion came to be the way it is, uh, these evolutionary forces. If you look at it as an evolutionary process that went from the prehistoric times up to the religions we have today, yeah. it actually all makes sense. And people understand why they wanted to believe this stuff so much, and it let, helps them to let go of those ideas. The actual title, you know, I could have called it the history of religion from an evolutionary point of view or, you know, but it's kind of an in-your-face title, unfortunately. <laughs> no, no, no. We like in-your-face titles, we really do. I mean, unfortunately, in the modern era, you have to have catchy titles. Right. Right. Well, do you think uh, that so. the, the title will scare some religious people who are maybe questioning? Do you think maybe it will scare them away? They say, oh, he's anti-religious. I don't want to read that. Yeah, it, yeah, it's certainly possible, and that, that was one of the... Uh, um, considerations when choosing the title, but I decided that a short, concise, yeah. memorable title was more important than perhaps offending a few people who might not read it anyway. Yeah, that's probably right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, you, do you have uh, a question? Yeah, I have we'll a question. We'll go him questions. and then yeah. my question. <laughs> my first question was, you talk about the evolution of organized religion and how is it that they adapt ideas not because they're true, but because they're popular and because they survive. So you were talking before, we were talking before this show about how like uh, polyistic, polyistic religions die off really often and it was the one that united a lot of people that was able to survive. Um, but in particular, I wanted to, for you to talk about it in the context of the Catholic Church because I believe there's interesting milestones in its development that evolved not out of scripture but because it was popular and because it allowed uh, a larger amount of people to be included and be, um, be, be able to spread the word more effectively. As an example would be like priests not marrying and being able to leave the real estate back to the church when they die. Uh, the, uh, the, um, the admission that Copernicus was right. right? Um, the, uh, Galileo. Galileo. Yeah, Galileo. Um, the um, you know, acceptance of gays in recent times uh, to become more more inclusive. Could you say something about that in that respect? Of course, yeah. The <clears throat> in order to respond, though, I, I really have to step back a few a few steps and talk about the basic thesis uh, about that you have to look at religion, all religions as being. If you think of each church or each set of memes, ideas, and so forth as being these evolving, competing entities that that uh, survive because they are better at convincing people that they're true or that people want to believe them. Um, you can look at the Catholic Church itself that way. That is, the Catholic Church is not a single thing. It's a bunch of people, it's a bunch of countries, it's a bunch of uh, different denominations, bishops, priests, and so forth. And even within that church, you have, you have many competing ideas. And over the years, uh, different factions within the church have, uh, have dominated. Another interesting thing uh, is that 
no no religious idea can survive in the face of really contrary facts. Oh, absolutely. So, so I mean, that's like evolution too. You can't, you know, take a goldfish that's really successful in a little pond somewhere and stick it in the desert. It's going to die. Right. And as the environment changes, if you know, you take like these sharks in, in Central America that where a, a body of water got cut off from the ocean and turned into fresh water, the sharks adapted and now they have freshwater sharks. Uh, that sort of thing. The church itself. Uh, as as its environment has changed, has been forced to evolve and adapt, and you have different factions within the church that pre predominate because the facts don't back up the people. And Galileo is probably the most obvious example mm -hmm. that you know when it when it came out, it seemed to be against God and uh, the Scripture, and um, it was real easy to believe that he was just wrong. But as the centuries went by, and mathematicians and scientists and geologists and everybody, at some point it was ridiculous for anybody in the church to say, no, that's just, you know, he's wrong. And so the church itself evolved these new memes to say, uh, actually, Galileo was right. So, and, and what, by the way, one of the most interesting things about the Catholic Church is that unlike so many others, they don't believe in the inerrancy of the Bible. They actually believe in the inerrancy of the Pope. Oh, really? And if, mm -hmm. if the Pope believes that the Bible is wrong about something, they don't take it literally. They just say, no, now we say it's this. And the Pope has a, a hotline to God, and I mean, not literally, but he's, <laughs> he's, <laughs> he's, he's well, he's infallible, theoretically. <laughs> yeah, and so and so they actually are far more adaptable than many other churches. Right. If you take you know somebody who's who's a absolute bi biblical literist, literalist, they don't have the kind of flexibility that the Roman Catholic Church does because the Roman Catholic Church's pope, the head of it, can always say, "No, we changed our mind." That's amazing. Maybe uh, we should get some of that for the evangelicals who you know the inerrant. So speaking of. Uh, you talk about how, you know, there used to be thousands of sects, and then eventually they either congeal or, or die out. Do you think there's a zero game? You know what I mean? Do you think maybe they're all sort of filtering together as the world gets smaller and we get more connected? Do you think that maybe religion will sort of congeal, especially um, the Abrahamic religion, sort of congeal into one? Do you think it's all funneling down into a, a oh, one mass? You know it's I mean? hard to predict something like that. Uh, if you, again, I always like to look at everything from an evolutionary point of view. And one of the things about evolution is a lot of it is accidental and yeah. just whatever happens to happen. But I'd rather think that it's the religions are going to uh, fade away as opposed oh. to continue to evolve into one. I mean, I'm sure we'll always have, at least for the next few hundred years, foreseeable future, we'll have religions. But one of the things, you know, I mentioned a minute ago that ideas religious ideas only survive to the extent that they fit the facts and so if you take something like um, well the internet for example has been very deadly to religion you, you, we were yes. talking before the show about the Mormons and the uh, the Mormon church has a very sordid history it's rather uh, of criminal behavior and fraud <laughs> yeah, and yeah. things like that just like fascinating yeah just like Scientology yeah. Yeah, and, and but the thing is, before the advent of the internet, most Mormons didn't know about this, and it was very easy for the Mormon church to hide their history from most of the, their adherents. Oh, I didn't know that. And so, I mean, who would know? Like the, the uh, Mountain Meadow Massacre, where... I, uh, yeah, I'm yeah, they, they killed exactly. a bunch of their own people. No, they killed a bunch of pastors. Oh, it, was a, it was a wagon know, train. Was it was a, something it else. It was a, like a hundred people, families moving west in a wagon train, and they, basic, and they had some racehorses with them, very valuable ones, and the Mormons basically killed them. They killed everybody who was... Uh, over eight years old, <laughs> uh, just massacred. Right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah. And then they took the children, that. right? They they raised yeah, the children of their own. Children would not be, yeah, yeah. I heard about this. The oh my god! Be, I didn't uh, know that. Valuable so. witnesses, and they stole all the wagons and all the horses and everything. How would you find out about that in the old days without the internet? You'd oh never find gosh. it in a library in Utah. Right. But but with the advent of the internet, many Mormons know about this sort of thing. They know about the criminal and fraudulent. Uh, backgrounds of their founders. They know about the history of the Mormon Church and how it was, you know, they had to move to Utah and how they were uh, at odds with the federal government over polytheism, uh, not no, polytheism, polygamy, polygamy yeah. uh, and so forth. And so it's been, uh, it's, it's really put a dent in the Mormon Church's ability to keep members. A lot of people are, are abandoning the church and so forth. And the only reason the church is still growing is because they believe in, in proselytization. Right. And they, well, and they I, attract I, a lot of new I, members. I, I, I like to make it aside and say, or, or continue with that line of thought and say a clear example of, of your book um, 
shedding some light on, on the Mormon church's evolution um, would be when they, they decided to no longer believe that black people were demons. <laughs> uh, like they, they literally believed that black people were <laughs> this, like the descendants of yeah. you know, we're a, gonna get a, a you. demonic <laughs> race, which is, you know, more racist. It and, just so and happened right. right when the, I mean, way after it started winding down, it just so happens that a revelation came just as the culture was evolving to be more inclusive exactly. of African Americans, of black people, right. that the church just happened to take that same turn. You know, yeah, it's exactly it, and another say, example where an idea can't, uh, a, a meme, an idea can't survive. Uh, when the facts or the culture or other things around right. it just completely my other favorite this is a much smaller scale and obviously not so important was it uh, I was told I heard that they uh, bought the uh, I can't remember if it was Coca-Cola or Pepsi-Cola one of the major uh, their major shareholder or owner of one of the big uh, soft drink companies and suddenly it became okay to drink caffeine. Oh really? <laughs> interesting. <laughs> that is yeah. interesting I heard they well, own half of Las Vegas now just, too but just, uh, just sort of um, just for fun, and in case you guys don't know, there's this great story that I, was one of my favorite like Mormon stories of showing how the the religion is like patently false. Um, Joseph Smith bought a manuscript from a traveling salesman, uh, and it was like an Egyptian papyr. I know this story. Right? Yeah. So <laughs> basically, the papyr is showing the story. Uh, you know, it's showing a story. Nobody knows what it says, right? Because nobody has codified yet what what Egypt Egyptian says, right? There was this thing, thing called the Rosetta Stone that was found in Egypt not that long ago, I mean, relatively speaking. For them, um, yeah. And, and that was translating uh, Greek, um, Egyptian into Greek into something else, and basically they were able to like now know what it means uh, when they're writing things in, in, uh, in jeroglyphics and Egyptian language. And long story short, Joseph Smith Con his community to believing that the papyr was telling a story about Abraham killing his son because he had somebody laying down in a, in a, in a ground oh, right. or some some type of structure. And long story short, it actually was about uh, the mummification of some individual. Yeah, can't recall the particulars, but you know it's, it's right there on the on the historical record, and you can look it up. And it just shows how it said that he went systematically so, uh, to lie to his own community. In he order was the to, first person yeah. to try to memeify religion. I, I mean, uh, it, it hasn't happened on that scale, I think. And, and, and then leading into that, mm -hmm. do you think, because Mormonism is a very new American-style religion, do you think there's going to be another one to pop up with the way you, from what you've researched and how religion works, do you think maybe there'll be a new religion soon to fit into our hyper-connected world? I, w I would hesitate to, to uh, predict anything like that. It certainly could happen if you look at the Reverend Sun, the Reverend Moon. You know, he has an awful lot of followers. Oh, absolutely. It's getting it's getting more difficult these days because people are much more, uh, much less gullible, and so many of these uh, quacks and charlatans and so forth get exposed much more quickly. There's always some small group who's willing to follow just about anybody. It's kind of oh, unfortunate. Yeah. People with needs, people with emotional needs or spiritual needs. And so you can never tell what what uh, somebody's going to um, what some character is going to find that'll get a bunch of people to believe in it. Um, I think it's more like the thing that scares me more is like the, the current political uh, oh, yes. situation where it's very anti-education and mm -hmm. anti-science and anti you know uh, climate science in particular, but so many other things that uh, I think there's a, the real danger is. Is not a, an immediate thing like that, but rather the slow erosion of education and rational thinking in America, and um, which would then, in twenty or thirty years, allow the rise of more and more fundamentalist beliefs. And so, do you think oh, that religion is trying to actively squish science to keep itself oh, absolutely. relevant? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you look at uh, the thing you mentioned early on about the uh, textbooks in, in, was it Alabama? It was Alabama, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a, and Texas, of course, has been notorious for doing that. That is a direct result of, of um, if you look back into, say, the 12th and 13th centuries and, and through 
the next few centuries. One of the interesting things about Islam is that it was very favorable to uh, science and education. In fact, they Christianity and, and, and Judaism were too. They, they fostered uh, research and so forth. All of these religions have now turned against um, education and science because as the science improved, for example, you, know, you talked about Galileo earlier and so forth, they slowly erode the need for any kind of god or gods. And so the churches that are surviving are the ones that actively don't believe that kind of stuff and, and advocate against it. Because if you encourage your, your members to become well-educated, uh, it's deadly to your religion. Right. You, and, uh, two if you look things. at the National Academy of Sciences, for example, they're like 96% atheists. Because right. by the time you get to the PhD level of science, you just can't believe any of that stuff. No. Right. And so it's only natural that religions actively discourage people from becoming educated, and therefore they actively discourage education. It's not an accident that those, that those textbooks are, are a core battleground for religion in America these days. They know if they lose these battles that their children who are required to go to school are going to learn things that will make them move away from their beliefs. It's just right. a fact. Uh, do, do why, why even fight for it if it's right. that easy, you know what I mean? Well, what I was going to yeah. say is, if you have time and you know, for the audience, there's this really interesting video with uh, Niall deGrasse Tyson, and he's basically saying this, he's, he's telling this really interesting story in the, about um, Islam in the Middle East, where it, it was, he tried to explain how when Islam started to grow, it was really inclusive, mm -hmm. and it started like a renaissance for the sciences because it allowed, it basically taxed religions instead of like dividing them, and it allowed a lot of like uh, scientific thought to be exchanged between cultures. Exactly. Yeah. And there's a lot of um, um, constellations named in Arabic. And uh, long story short, somebody came up with this book in Islam that basically was saying that math and calculations were, you know, the works of the devil or something to that effect. Yeah. And that just tanked like the culture, right? Like yeah. and now now you know when you think like great uh, scientific achievements yeah, they're not uh, they're not like correlated with the, with Islam, right? You think well, about any religions really nowadays. Well, I mean, so. Judaism actually has a lot of people. Oh yeah, it's true. Uh, but, uh, that's one thing. I yeah. Uh, but I would say like it's a it's a great example of how said so the religion suffocates scientific inquiry and how it had a great um, effect, unfortunate effect in the Middle Eastern culture. Uh, oh. Our producer, our you know. Local God here is uh, <laughs> making sure we ask you about the bullet points of your book. Yeah. What do you want the audience to remember from from so, this? So your first one is why do why do you worship Abraham's God? Uh, you as in you know the audience you're trying to find. Why do why do they worship Abraham's God instead of Zeus or Pele or Thor? Pele? What is Pele? Is Pele player? is a whole <laughs> oh, Pele is the Hawaiian god of volcanoes. Oh, that's awesome! I would worship yeah. a, vo a volcano god. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah, why why is Abraham's god so darn popular as well, opposed that's, that's, to a cool volcano god? Yeah, that's a very good question, and it's actually the the uh, uh, subject of an entire chapter of my book. Mm -hmm. If you look at, there's a whole bunch of things that are required for a god to become a, a global god. If you look at the, and, and again, we have to go back through the, <coughs> excuse me, the whole history of religion. It starts off, people have uh, believe in animism. They, you know, think there's a spirit of the bear, a spirit of the deer, a spirit of the cloud, that kind of thing. And if you look at the history, as time goes forward, these things uh, become like meta-gods. They'll become like a spirit for clouds in general, not just for that one cloud or a weather spirit. Or, and they finally turn into gods, and you have a bunch of them. And, but they tend to be local and regional and so forth. Like, for example, Abraham, I mean, um, the god of the Jews, uh, Elohim or El, he goes by various names, Jehovah. Um, he was originally a regional god. He was only, and the Jews, in fact, when they went on their exodus, one of their worries was they wouldn't be able to worship him because he lived where they were and they were going to leave that place. <laughs> they and didn't so, think he could come along too? No, they didn't because that's how people believed in those days, oh, uh, that gods were regional. So there were a whole bunch of different things that had to evolve in this god meme in order to make it a global god. It had to go from this regional angry war god uh, to take on more and more abilities, like you know, if you, in the in the Greek and Roman times, they had gods for different things. But it's actually handy if you can just go to one place and ask one guy for whatever it is you need. So there and wasn't, so there wasn't like the idea of omnipresence back then. No, no, there wow. was not. And not only that, but the gods were not thought to be uh, of 
ethereal stuff, but rather of humans. But originally, even even Jehovah was thought as, as having flesh and blood, and made of the same stuff as us. You know, a long time ago, most of the gods were like Pele, the one of Hawaii, for example, was thought to be the sister of a girl from uh, Tahiti. She and they two they sailed to Hawaii. They had a big fight. Anyway, she became the god. So how could somebody, you know, take a god like Pele? That god can't be worshipped everywhere because she lives by a volcano in Hawaii. Oh, wow. It's not a very good meme that could that could uh, expand and take over the world. And this is true of species in general. If you look at animal species, uh, in any given ecosphere, there's only room for one animal that fills a particular ecological right. niche. You take wolves and coyotes, they look alike, but they're not quite the same, and so they can survive in the same area. But you won't have two very closely related species of wolves living in the same area. Right. They have to, because the, that, the wolves will expand out and, and uh, take over all the other species that are like them that have the same ecological niche. And so a god like Pele couldn't do that, but as the Abrahamic god became more and more capable, more and more ethereal, more and more omnipotent, and was able to travel around and be the god of the whole world and not just the god of the Middle East, and uh, became less and less human and more and more um, uh, omnipotent and so forth, he became a god who could be worshipped by anyone everywhere, and so wow. it's only natural that he was the one who could spread, uh, as opposed to some of the other ones that you talked about. So, in fact, go ahead. So where does, where does the idea of omnipresence, where does that come from? Where did that evolve from? Uh, it evolved just from this general uh, process of, um, it's, it's not a single thing. The best way to think of it is it's a slow process. Imagine you have two rabbis arguing about, you know, whether God can do this or can do that. And one of them says, well, my God's basically more powerful than yours. It's a better idea. You know, my God doesn't just hang out in the Middle East. He actually is in control of Germany and England and everybody else. And uh, that's a better idea, and it's more believable. It's the kind of thing that people want to believe, that their God is more omnipotent. Hmm. And, and so as, as time goes by, those are the ideas that survive and get codified into our religions. It's so, not a matter that somebody thought of it. It's rather, it's this general idea of who God is that gets passed on. I tell it to you, you tell it to your daughter. She tells it to her son, tells it to a neighbor. These ideas evolve and morph, and then as time goes by, the best one, the most uh, interesting or powerful or fittest in the terms of evolution, that's the one that survives. You can't point to any one thing. It's just that the, as an idea gets better and better, it spreads more. Right. So, like um, in your book, why is a single all-purpose God far better than a bunch of special purpose gods? Exactly. Yeah. Because, because um, it just, it's just like a species that if one species has more, look at humans, for example. Why are we all over the world? Because uh, we're smart and we can take up all these ecological niches and compete against all these other animals that, that are not as smart as us and aren't as capable and can't right. walk as far and can't see as well and, and so forth. I mean, we're just a better deal than, than the chimpanzees and elephants and so forth. It and just the works. Same, yeah. yeah, and so, you know, just, just like the Abrahamic God was better than all of the other ones, it took over their ecospheres and, and they went extinct. So the, um, another question we wanted to ask you was, yeah. um, from your book, um, why can't polytheism compete with monotheism? I think you already asked that, right? Did I already ask yeah. that? Did I already ask <laughs> that? No. It's, 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 it's closely related, related to that same question. Closely yeah. related. Why is religion necessarily hostile to science? I wanted to yeah. hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. Well, we talked about that we a little about bit. That. Uh, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, yeah, I mean, um, uh, go ahead. It, it, as, like we were saying earlier, as the world gets smaller, so does religion, has to. So maybe religion will, okay. So we, we talked about Ken Ham in our, in our um, news mm -hmm. this morning, talked about how um, Cosmos and Neil deGrasse Tyson makes kids want to worship stars and nature and all that nonsense. Well, um, he also says that aliens can't be saved. This is true. Because he said that because it, um, God, you know, Jesus came for the original sin of Adam, you know what I mean? But aliens aren't a part of that, so there's no point in going and trying to contact them because they can't be saved. You know, or something like that. It, so it's hard. It's hard to know what to say about an idea like is, that. It is, <laughs> but it's a it's a way that you have to. And people say that there's the new religions, like anti-vax movement. Mm. 
is uh, is kind of a religious is taking a religious sort of bent. Well, no, I don't no, think no, so. I think that yeah. people just trying to. It's just a community, oh, it's, right? It's like definitely. A, yeah, the, the I don't want to get too sidetracked on that. Yeah, I don't want to get too right, sidetracked. Exactly. But I was religious thinking, argument. as a way of um, evolving, as religion needs to evolve with culture mm -hmm. to move on, and as we, as a people, embrace science and technology more, we're going to need to get a religion that embraces it as well. well it works in some places, and it doesn't work in others. Good example. So this, um, this goes yeah. back to something that the, yeah. that uh, we talked about a minute ago: that that no species can survive in a hostile environment. Environment. Right, and the problem is that the the uh, religion lives in your brain. That's the ecosphere of ideas. It's your <laughs> yes. brain, my brain, everything else. And in order to reproduce, they have to be able to communicate. I have to be able to communicate an idea to you, or via a book to somebody else, and so forth. And if the environment is hostile to that idea, I mean, take Ken Ham. He's a perfect example. Mm -hmm. You know, they the, there was a good article I saw that was uh, going around the other day about the uh, engineering of Noah's Ark. And it turns out it's just it just simply wouldn't work because right. the ship is so. They gave an example of the largest wooden ship ever built, and the thing fell apart and sank <laughs> because at some point, when it gets to be four or five hundred feet long, wood is not strong enough as a as a structural material to hold a ship that size together. And so you have that kind of knowledge, which is new, and uh, an idea that that Noah built an ark like that. Is refuted by the simple facts, and then you guys mentioned you can't get all the animals on there. It's ridiculous, and there's all these different things that you know. When I was a kid, nobody thought of those things, and and mm -hmm. you never heard those kind of arguments against the ark. And now they're widespread. I'm sure there were. I'm sure people had pointed these things out, but the internet wasn't available, and the science wasn't available, and so forth to to the average person, so they could believe something like the ark. Now. Anybody who really wants to know, they just go and look and say, wait a second, this, this must be mythology. You know, it's a good story. It illustrates something or other about sin and redemption, but it didn't really happen. Right. And so the, no idea can survive in our culture if it just flagrantly is at odds with, with what everybody knows. And this is why it goes back to your question a minute ago of why uh, religion has to be hostile to science because it's the so-called God of the gaps that religion right. used to explain everything. And now there's virtually nothing that it needs to explain anymore. Yeah. We, know, we know how the universe came to be. We know how old it is. We know uh, how we came to evolve to our current state. We understand not only science, but also philosophy and ethics. We understand much more about the basis of human ethics and, and our biological imperatives and things like that. Right. We don't need answers for these things anymore. We can figure them out for ourselves. And um, so another bullet point we have here is why yeah. must heaven and hell? Why do we have to have both of them? <laughs> why, do, why, does, why, do we, why do they have to coexist? Well, it's kind of a complex question. Um, um, the, uh, That's well, not a good... <laughs> Didn't Freud no, say well, something it's about like, it? It's like, like many things that you have. Yeah. They're both really flip sides of the same thing. I mean, if you had heaven, um, what would, it's like everybody would go there, right? What would be the point? Either you get there or not. And some, some people, in fact, I believe the Catholic Church doesn't really have the same concept of hell as the evangelicals do. They just say that not getting into heaven is such a terrible punishment to not be in God's oh, presence yeah. mm. that that's like hell. You know, I think you Judaism. Realize, Judaism is similar. Judaism yeah, Ju similar Judaism, I, you know, that was the original concept. Um, so, yeah, but that's, that's a little bit of a tricky question. Um, I'm not sure I could explain it. It is in my book, and uh, but, I, you know, it's, it's complex. <laughs> I mean, is it a fear thing? Do they want you to... Since they can't, since they can't hide behind, it's like a carrot and stick sort of. Yeah, thing, it is. You know, it, that's along. exactly right. It's it's motivating yeah. from both directions. Yeah. That people are very afraid. Um, I mean, first of all, I I find the idea of hell to be rather uh, abhorrent. The idea that you could be punished forever. What do you mean? What do you mean? Well, I mean, yes, we you agree, but we want to know what you mean. Yeah. yeah. Well, the idea. That, I mean, if you think of the age of the universe and things like that, you know, the <laughs> idea that in your uh, meager 75 years here on Earth, you could make a few mistakes and then be subject to billions of years of not just torture, not just, I mean, imagine the, the kind of things they describe aren't just bad, they're, they're horrifying. Mm -hmm. They're just horrifying. And th they're so out of proportion to uh, any kind of wrongdoings that somebody might have did, particularly those, there are religions that believe that if you uh, merely don't believe in Jesus, um, that, or if you didn't have the opportunity to, to be taught about Jesus, that you would experience this horrifying punishment. It's tough just, luck. Yeah, it's, tough luck. Yeah, it's to a you. Fu it's a f 
a, a really flawed philosophy. It's an immoral philosophy. Absolutely. Right? That anybody could even think that that could that, that that could be true. And if you do believe it's true, then I don't want to have anything to do with your God because he's an awful person. Right. Well, like um, I guess no. that's the, sort of the reason why they bought in the uh, the concept of sin. Like there are things that you can yeah, do. Yeah, that's a really good point. The yeah. the the whole idea of. Um, Especially some of the sins that the Christians in particular have come up with. Well, I guess everybody, I shouldn't single them out. It's like they take normal stuff that we all like to do, sex being the most obvious one. And you say uh, this thing that we all, we're, we're so powerfully programmed by our genes, by our biology to want to reproduce. And sex, because of, because of how important it is to evolution, has become something that we're strongly driven to do. And it's very pleasurable and it draws us to our mate and our spouse. And they vilify that. They say, this is an awful thing. And if you have these feelings of lust, that you're a bad person. So, oh, so yeah. they start off by creating an awful situation that just shouldn't exist in the first place. It's nonsense. Since it, sex is a good thing, not a bad thing. And they vilify it and they say, by the way, we have the cure. We will forgive you for doing this, but you have to come to us. You have to come <laughs> to our particular doctrine. You have to follow our rules. Right. You know, we're telling you what's bad and we're the only ones who can fix it for you. And, and the thing is, it's very believable. It's a very powerful idea. People have a, a tendency to believe that type of stuff, that the things they want must somehow be bad. Yeah. And it's a cultural thing that's instilled. It's interesting the Jews don't feel that way, that they've, they, they have this philosophy that God gave you this gift, and it's kind of a sin not to, uh, not to take God's gift oh. and use it. You know, good food and, and the pleasures of sex within the confines of marriage right. uh, are things that are a gift to you, and it's, a, it's, it's wrong to not take advantage of those and enjoy God's gifts. I like that philosophy a lot there's, better. Um, but it's not as powerful. You notice there's more Christians than Jews. Yeah. yeah. On the other yeah. hand, you could talk about the flip side and the, the benefits of using sin, right, in order to keep a, a community together and uh, in creating, um, I guess, a health infrastructure. If you look at the Old Testament, you you could see how they shun particular types of food. And one of the reasons they did that is because a lot of um, well, a lot of them were unhealthy, right? A lot of them well not, had um, diseases, right? I, I believe... Um, like pork. Like pork. It's hard pork, to raise pork, right? in the it desert. Had, it yes. had a higher likelihood of killing you, basically. Yeah. And um, uh, many of the things they were trying to say they were sinful at the time were kind of like a, you know, like a shorthand of, of things like, well, these people eat, eat this type of food and die. Maybe we should make it sinful so that nobody else eats it and dies. Mm -hmm. So it's... Um, a similar way that they use sin in order to um, to be able to take care of that community, and they might they might not know that viruses are a thing, right? right. But like if they're able to to explain that to people in the you know, in, a, in a structure that they can comprehend, then they're able to keep their uh, community healthy. And it's like um, uh, some things that are sinful to one group might not be sinful to another group. And is that um, like one of the reasons why missionaries, uh, you know, travel around to try to spread their ideas of shame and blah blah blah. And it's the one way to get it work. You get your people to feel that what they're doing, their natural processes are bad, but we have the solution. So we invent the illness, and we also sell you the pill to cure, cure it. Cure, yeah. Is that what it's like? That's pretty much it, and it's yeah. it's uh, it's a matter of convincing people. Uh, well, and again, it's not a matter of convincing people. A better way to put it is that as as the centuries rolled by these so-called sins, uh, the churches, the, the, these sins evolved into better and better things because a church that had that said that something was. Um, you know, a little bit bad, but not really so bad. That church isn't here anymore. Right. And the, these various sins evolved as the churches and the religions and the, these meme plexes um, were successful. The ones that had the ones that were scariest are the ones that survived. And the ones that had ideas that weren't so scary didn't survive. Right. So we, they, all of these ideas of sin and so forth, it, it's sort of like if you think about how your brain works. I don't know if you guys are familiar with drug receptors. Your brain has all these receptors in it that are programmed to fit certain molecules really well that your body makes, and that's how your body communicates. And when you can make a drug that fits in there too, like opium fits into your serotonin receptors. Mm -hmm. Well, you can think of these cultural receptors, things that we're programmed biologically to want to believe for one reason or another. And the memes evolved to fit into those receptors really well. Uh, over the centuries, and that's for some reason the idea that sex is a sin seems to evolve, seems, seems to resonate. It probably has to do with our um, our biological urges to 
uh, want to keep our wives to ourselves so that we won't have to raise somebody else's children oh. and fidelity and things like that. That we have this idea, we're programmed to have a lot of very strong feelings about sex and reproduction and family and children and so forth. And these memes evolved to fit into those biological or ev those uh, social receptors. That's brilliant. They're, Interesting. Yeah, they're, they're very good at it. Brilliant. So, That's uh, how evolution works. It, That's how viruses work, is they, they evolve to hijack some mechanism that's already there. Uh, the, the, a regular virus will get into your cell and it'll hijack the reproductive stuff that all the chemicals that cause your cell, that would normally cause your cell to, to split in two and make two cells. They make a hundred or so viruses and finally the, the cell just kind of and it bursts and then you got a hundred viruses that go out and infect the next cell. That's it's amazing. the same idea. They're taking a working mechanism and they're hijacking it for their own purposes. In this wow. case, they're hijacking our natural understanding, our biological understanding of our desire to produce children and to raise our own children, not somebody else's children, and to keep our spouse, our mate with us so that we have two of us to raise our children instead of one. They're hijacking all that mechanism and turning into this idea of sin, which fits perfectly into that, into they, that part of our brain. Yeah. Then they can claim that, no, no, the original is natural. This is the way you're supposed to feel. No, yeah, it's, it's the, the opposite, right? It's the other way around. Yeah. We're, we're biologically programmed to hi have these ideas, and religion has evolved to take advantage of them. So can you tell our readers, what, you, uh, your book is amazing. Can you tell our readers Thank where you. they can go and grab a copy? Well, of course, uh, it's available on Amazon. That's uh, the place it's for sale. Yay. It's, uh, you can get it on Kindle or as a paperback. And your yeah. website? You want to give us a plug? Yeah, it's the religionvirus.com or actually religionvirus.com. I think yeah. you can go to the religionvirus.com too, and that works. That's awesome. Yeah. And um, yeah. your other book um, is, is Christianity Chris Dying. Yes, I have. That, I actually took that book off the market. Uh, it was fun. It was just a project. I blogged for a while. Um, it was. Uh, I blogged about. I wrote about 500 blogs. Um, and we took the best hundred of those and made them into a book just kind of for fun because people wanted uh, it's I don't know if you guys have a uh, oh, it is. Hey. But, it's cool. uh, you can't we see get the it picture anymore. but so we can't get that book no I took it off the market I might put it back on again in the future uh, some of them are very timely and it's been about four or five years since I last wrote anything I think if I was gonna put it back on the market again I would uh, add a few more blogs about recent events and things like that it's like my, 99 uh, reflections in religion, science, and morality. Yeah. And by the way, uh, I have not been very involved in religion because I have just published this book. It's my first uh, novel. It's called The Zarabian Incident. It's, oh, cool. Uh, Is that it's fiction? About, yes, it's about terrorism. Oh, so you, you can get that on Amazon too, but I haven't started marketing it heavily yet. But, well, uh, so this is the first, our 150th episode is the first time you've mentioned it? <laughs> yes, that's All right. right. <laughs> so, I mean, well, good luck. I mean, with that, I, I um, uh, one quick question, because we're going to start wrapping up here in about uh -huh. uh, five or six minutes. But okay. um, so you have the 99 reflections. What's your favorite one? Oh, gosh. Uh, that's hard to say because I like them all. That's why I put them in here. <laughs> Actually, one of my favorites uh, was not one that I wrote. It's one that my wife wrote uh, after her brother passed away. He died early of, he, in his early 50s of uh, complications from hepatitis and diabetes. Um, and it was, uh, it was called Laurel's Wager, and it's based on Pascal's Wager. Are you familiar with that? Yes. yes. Yeah, of course, for the listeners who aren't, Pascal had this idea that you're better off to go to church than not, because if you're wrong um, and God doesn't exist, you're going to be in big trouble. Uh, <laughs> and, and if you're right that God doesn't exist, it won't matter. You will have gone to church, but what's the harm in that? So he said, you might as well pretend you believe in God, which is kind of silly. Mm, disingenuous, but, really. Yeah, well, it is, and a lot of people have refuted that. But my wife um, wrote this thing about um, the idea that what the real wager is that life is good and the thing that we all agree that we leave behind is the good work that we do in the the the, yeah. the, the world you can be christian or jewish or muslim or atheist or uh, universalist whatever you are and we all know that while we're here on the earth we make a difference to people and that difference carries on for generation after generation after generation uh, whether you believe that when you die you go to heaven or not you know that you can make the world a better place yeah. i've spoken at several funerals and one of the things I like to say is that this person left the world a better place than he or she came in oh. and really that is a morality that we can all agree on no matter who we are and that's the essence of, of her wager is lead your life 
lead a good life, leave the, the world a better place than you came in, and no matter who you are, that'll be a good thing. Right. That's a better wager than, than Pascal's wager. Yeah. That you can win that me. one every time. That reminds me of an old Greek proverb. Is like, um, it's a tragedy that old men will plant trees whose shade they'll never be able to sit under. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But um, it's, a, it's a, um, I'm sorry, go ahead. It's a good example of the, the uh, pay it forward thing. That yeah. doesn't mean you shouldn't plant trees. It means that, you know, you should be you should be thankful that your grandchildren will be able to enjoy those trees, exactly. and that's a, that ought to be enough for you. That's exactly. And I can't think of a religion that actually really says that. <laughs> I mean, I don't really. I mean, what other religions say that? No, it's all about worship the God, not about what you do to improve. It's what God has done to improve blank. Yeah, and it never and really they never really um, build up their adherence. Uh, this is what I've noticed. Well, I'm you have to be careful. I mean, I, although I somewhat agree with you, the, the thing is that it's one of the things that we have to be careful of as humanists and atheists and so forth is not to paint all religions and all religious people with the same brush. There are some very good religious people in the world. Do you think they're who, good religions? Um, I think there are some that are not as bad as others. Uh, <laughs> Uh, right, right. Whether they're good or not is kind of an abstract question because it's hard to know what the world would be like if we didn't have religions. I do think one of the problems with religion is it tends to make people not think as much as they should. They accept answers as being given rather than questioning everything. And right. so from that point of view, I don't care for religion. But yes, there are better, there are religions in the world that are... Uh, the, I don't, I don't want to characterize them as good or bad, but they do many, many good things and that aren't as bad. There are religions that are unquestionably very bad. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So. No, and, and I agree <laughs> with you. I, I think that um, uh, you know, I, I, there's many religions that do think forward and they try to make the best that they can for their children and their, you know, the, the communities that come after The best after you could them. do is be benign, mm -hmm. I think. Well, and, and we have to admit that, that religion does give people a great deal of comfort in many situations, especially death and dying, things like that. We may not believe that it's true, but it really does comfort people. Oh, absolutely. And, and so, um, is that good or bad? Uh, a lot of people think it's good. So, it's, it's, not, a, it's not a slam dunk question. All right, well, we're going to start wrapping up here, and I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you so much. We know we called it a bad time. <laughs> so thank you so much for joining us. Um, please go to Amazon.com and search for The Religion Virus by Craig A. James. It is a great book. I think will it be religious or not. Check it out. See what he has to say. I would say it's a great eye-opener. And um, uh, don't forget to go to Religion Virus. Know the... <laughs> dot com <laughs> to check out his book and um, thank you so so much for yeah, joining thank us. Thank you for your time. And we'd like to thank have you, you very back much one for day. having me. I, I very much appreciate the time, the opportunity to be on your show. All right, and thank you, audience. Don't forget mm -hmm. to watch us on YouTube, yeah. like us on Facebook, and follow us on. Do we have a Twitter? I don't think we, we have a Twitter. We should have a Twitter, but if we don't, we'll get one. All righty. Live long and prosper. Live long and live long and prosper. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's do that.